Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. Uh, and it's always tough. And I, I really saw something to keep you awake uh, was getting done. I hope my session is not boring. For all that effort that she was putting in to keep you awake, you go back to sleep. Uh, so financial inclusion in digital age, I think, was the topic that I was asked to speak on. And uh, as I was thinking about it before coming in here, I realized there are two or three interesting data points I was looking at. And I felt, uh, why should even a word called financial inclusion be used along with digital age? And here are my reasons to question the topic itself on which I'm speaking. Uh, number one, I think today in digital, it's not about inclusion anymore. It's about exclusion. How can you exclude someone out? Especially when we look at uh, data, the way India has progressed today, we have 400 million uh, internet users in rural India, in India. So close to 52% of the India's population has access to internet. That's actually at par or little more than what it is in urban India. So it's not that the rural is, is behind. I think the access to data, access to device is there today in rural India. Uh, if you look at even the consumption of data today, uh, of course, we all know that India's uh, data pricing is the cheapest in the world. So that again solves the question of not just having access to data or device, but also the affordability of using it. Uh, and India, again, as you would know, is not just the cheapest, but also the consumption of data in India is among the highest in the world. So that's again the third data point and on an average, uh, if you look at in India, there's a consumption of over 20 GB. Uh, some of the largest YouTube channels that are popular in India are consumed in the rural India. Uh, anyone can guess which is the most watched YouTube channel in India? Anyone here? Perfect, you got it, yes. So I think today when we look at every single matrix as I was looking at, uh, you realize that the data, the intent, the consumption, uh, the penetration, I think all of that from the digital foundation is available in our country. But still when it comes to financial inclusion, we realize that we haven't done as good a job as access to data and access to devices. And I think that is the real challenge uh, for everybody who's involved in building the, the financial framework in India. Uh, initially, it was largely because we needed a branch or a physical distribution network to offer formal financial service, be it insurance or be it lending or be it any other product. I think thanks to the banking correspondence, the last mile access to financial service got solved in most markets where there was an inbound remittance flow. The second big change that started to happen is access to credit thanks to the microfinance institutions, uh, largely focused again on the self-help groups, uh, mostly women. And again, we realized that the credit quality to uh, whatever lending is done through microfinance to women has been far, far better than whatever you get to do in other markets. So I think what has started to happen over a period of time is certain models, which were not necessarily digital, started to become more prominent. So like I mentioned, microfinance, BCs, they were still human and human going and offering the last mile access to financial service uh, in the rural India while they had a device which works on internet. And this is our classic challenge today that there is access to digital, but still the financial service 
has failed to go on the digital railroad that we have built in this country. Uh, be it Aadhaar, be it access to credit now, a lot of those have started to move and create again foundational framework. So here comes the question now. If we still are doing a lot of financial service through human, while one has access to all the devices and data uh, and intent to be digital, how do we solve for it? Uh, some of my learning uh, of building things at Kotak, uh, especially when we did 811, uh, was one classic digital example that comes to my mind. Uh, we started, uh, we launched this digital bank. In last six years, we got about close to 30 million customers who came through digital. So as a bank, we had about 8 million customers till 2016. Today, we have over 40 million customers. So we just went five times of our base in last six years. Uh, when we look at this data, where are these customers coming from? And who are these customers? We'll be surprised that we couldn't still service a lot of customers from pin codes that we never had a physical presence. The intent of a customer is there. I think customer today is ready to come digitally. He or she wants the same experience of financial service as he or she gets while shopping on a Misho or a Flipkart or Amazon or watching a Netflix. I think the challenge has always been a bit around how do we do the KYC, the last mile, if cash is still required. But customers are still saying we don't want cash. We are okay to be completely digital. This is coming from the rural India, mind you. This is not a phenomena that we are hearing from tier two and tier three town. This is what we are hearing from tier four, tier five, and tier six. That means the places where the population is below 50,000 and probably even few thousands. So I think this is how the Indian consumers are ready to embrace digital. Uh, we got 30 to 40% customers whom we could not onboard came from areas that we couldn't service. So out of 16,000 PIN codes, we opened about 6,000 PIN codes and we still had a lot of demand. We always thought that you need a physical bank branch for customers to know you. But in a digital era, I think the customers don't care whether you even have a physical branch network. I think that is what customers were telling us. Uh, we went and said, even if we get you onboarded, how will you use a debit card? They said, we don't need debit card. There is UPI. So now you start thinking of how the customers have progressed faster uh, than what financial institutions have been able to really move ahead. And I think this is where the Indian consumers are moving. Uh, I think we still have, as I mentioned, there is a lot we need to do to access. It's a part of it sits through what we can do through regulatory uh, changes. Uh, some part of it is about ensuring that the risk factors are duly mitigated and we are not putting customers at risk. Because we are also seeing something increasingly as a financial divide is that those who are coming into financial service for the first time through digital, it's very different to be on a Facebook and a WhatsApp and watch a YouTube uh, because that's all content, shopping. You're not putting yourself at real risk, even if there are breaches around your data and privacy. But when it comes on to the real money that you have, uh, I think in India, we still have a lot of challenge around the financial literacy. Uh, when we look at how digital accounts get opened, you start finding that just like SIM cards, uh, there are people who will say, okay, I'll get you a bank account open, get me your Aadhaar, get me your details. I will download the app and I'll get you to do this. Uh, assisting customers is okay, but I think protecting customers from not falling prey to such instances is where I think we are all not taking the full stride out to ensure more and more such products are offered. I think all of us saw what happened to the Chinese loan apps in India. Uh, that again was because a lot of customers just didn't know what they've clicked on, uh, what terms and conditions have they agreed upon, uh, how the data and consent is obtained. 
And I think this is where a lot of recent regulations in India uh, are going to help ensure that while we continue to provide access to the last mile, everybody in the country, but still we are able to protect customers from bad actors who may exploit some of this. I think two or three other things before I conclude is changing and I'm pretty upbeat about it. One is on the recent guidelines, which is on the data privacy. Uh, I do understand and see that the consent-based architecture on data uh, will provide those who do not have access to credit uh, in a formal manner because they don't have a bureau record or they uh, don't have the way to show their credit worthiness. Uh, for a short-term credit, how do they get access to it? The second is on the insurance. I think government has done a lot in terms of the Atal Bhima Yojana and Pension, uh, which is a micro insurance products. I think banks and insurance companies have also started to build a lot of sachet, micro insurance, micro investment product. I think that is the second fundamental change that's going to happen and it's happening. So short term, small value credit, micro insurance and sachet based investment product. We again tried doing this through 811 where we brought even our the insurance premium as low as 800 rupees. Idea was to test or a SIP as low as 100 rupees. And we realized that there are customers who want to invest just that they don't have a regular income like most of us here and thereby they are not able to plan a certain amount that they can assure to invest every month. So I think creating more innovative products like these. We are also seeing recently, as you would have heard, the RBI Innovation Hub. And RBI came out with another product called Kisan Credit Card, uh, where a lot of states have started now to digitize the land records, uh, the assets uh, that the rural India has. And against those assets, they are able to avail credits and loans up to 2 lakhs. So I think products like these are going to start now getting more and more deeply integrated. Similarly, the insurance, which is on agri, the weather and crop insurance, which gets the weather data, the farm data, and, and bring in uh, a micro insurance products that farmers can avail. So I think it needs a very different mindset uh, of creating products distributing products, underwriting, and understanding the risk associated with it. And this job alone cannot be done only by financial institutions, be it banks, insurance companies, or asset management companies. I think this is where I strongly believe that it is a model of partnership where somebody is able to bring data, uh, someone is able to do the last mile service and connectivity like the BCs and microfinance institutions were doing. And we leverage the digital for discovery and servicing of customers. So I think this is a completely new business model. And as institutions start to either carve out a dedicated team or look at this as a separate focused area, uh, this won't happen the way it is bound to. But this is where the next set of growth from India is coming because if you look at all data, and it's not just internet data, you look at FMCG sales, you look at uh, now the car sales below 3 lakhs, the tractor sales, a lot of products are getting bought and consumed in the rural and the tier 4, tier 5 India. And I think this is where the next set of opportunities are coming, be it on the consumption-led finance or saving or investment or insurance. Uh, so I think the potential is huge. We have just not scratched the surface. And uh, this is an opportunity for all the stakeholders across to find uh, not just what kind of products, but what are the pools of profit and how do you distribute. So it's not a business of charity. There is actually a good business model that is being built out here. And as we start imagining this uh, beyond just offering few products, I think we'll miss this great opportunity in our country. I am uh, Ravi Gupta, CEO of Alex. Uh, Good to see you again. Excellent speech. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, uh, the speed uh, uh, at which the uh, 
digital uh, is adoption is happening in the bfsi sector is among us so how are you seeing this uh, uh future in say uh, almost like 2 years or 3 years uh, from now with and what are the new buzzwords like ai or the other uh, things which are going to uh, transform this digital adoption in bfsi if you have any uh, views on that sure i think great question uh so three or four key themes that i see that is changing and changing really fast in india uh one is i think the india stack what started with identity and payment i think we are moving ahead now to the data stack which is now moving up there is a stack which is on the credit which is through the oken which is the open credit enabled network uh then ondc which is on the ecom network so i think india is perhaps the only country in the world which is building and continues to build a lot more public infrastructure stack for good uh, so that makes it easier for different institutions to start building similarly the health stack is another one and i think siksha which is the education stack uh, so i think for each stack it gives opportunity to build the next set of businesses and i think that is transformational for us i think the second big change we are seeing in india is on the msme side uh, while today the topic here was financial inclusion so i didn't speak on that but uh, i think msme is a big big growth engine for this country uh, just few days back in fact i i wrote a post even on linkedin on that uh, because i think that is a very unique story for a country like ours uh, because india's story is based on two big pegs one is the consumer driven consumption demand on which beat housing demand automobile demand consumer goods white goods finally everything that you do there is a need for credit and i think you see a lot more happening with formalization of economy both on the individual side and on the msme side i'm not too concerned about the large corporates here because they get service just like high net worth individual gets serviced reasonably well but msme i think with the gst uh, lending products getting built where you have a surrogate to demonstrate your gst return to get access to credit uh, oken is is a great way forward i think lot of that is changing i think the third thing big shift we are seeing is on the technology led transformation itself uh, because indian financial institutions across sector are investing massively on upgrading their technology be it moving to cloud be it building the api led uh structure for not just growing organically uh but getting integrated across different ecosystems so you want to be on amazon and you see your offer that on checkout you can get a loan uh or a pre approved or co branded products credit cards etc so i think a lot more of the tech stack is creating again opportunity beat for tech vendors or for those who are uh, providing service support and the fourth i would say is is big big push now is on ai and uh, unlike what we saw with web 3.0 and blockchain which was more of a hype and experimental stuff i think ai uh, be, even before we got into the gen ai uh, bandwagon i think ai was something that financial institutions for last 4 5 years were investing significantly because be it cleaning up their data investing on the core data stuff be it through data warehouse or uh, data lake house which became subsequently or building in the whole ai models on top of it for credit risk fraud prediction uh, for security authentication and now the llms are getting used for key areas like training uh, the contact center agents to service customers well so that you have a huge issue on training people across all the skill sets in a short span of time so i think gen ai before it moves to the front i think a lot of gen ai work has started to be at the back uh, which is going to power human to be more smarter uh, while managing uh, each of these areas presentations uh, transaction monitoring cognitive ocr uh which again the gen ai is able to read and uh, predict what is the next best action 
and i think these are the kind of things that will continue to drive the change in financial service so thanks excellent question ravi